Hello, this is Mr. Hammond Beyer again, and this is Lecture 11, um, Part 2, Continuation of Air Pollution with a Focus on Indoor Air Pollution. Um, uh, according to the EPA, the four most dangerous indoor air pollutants are tobacco smoke, formaldehyde, radioactive radon, and fine and ultra-fine particulate matter. That's less than 10 and less than 2.5 uh, micrometers. Formaldehyde, how does formaldehyde become an indoor air pollutant? Let's see if we can figure that one out. Okay, so if you look at a classic house, um, uh, especially in the northern parts of this country, they might have a kerosene heater upstairs, a wood-burning stove, maybe a basement, and you'll notice in different levels there are sources of indoor air pollution. So that um, a kerosene heater might give off nitrous oxides, as was the, with the wood stove. Um, dry cleaning might bring in some tetrachloroethylene. Um, styrene might be in the carpeting. And benzopyrene um, from cigarette smoke or tobacco smoke. Radon-22 might be coming up through the basement and seeping into the house. Um, carbon monoxide, if it's a gas water heater, might be being emitted. Particulates from baking or cooking. Those are just a few of um, the possible contaminants. Another problem that we don't want to think about very often is household dust mites. So any carpeted surface is going to have lots and lots of micro spaces. And there are lots of dust mites that are there. They feed on skin. You probably have some kind of mites in your eyebrows as we speak. Um, uh, but they like bedding and furniture, and they can cause asthma attacks for people that are sensitive to them, allergic reactions also in some other people. Okay, so what are the health impacts of bad air pollution or air quality? Um, uh, certainly you know that on a day, if you go outside and there's a lot of pollen in the spring, especially that pollen gets into your nose, then there are um, goblet cells in your nose that get exacerbated or turned on by that pollen, which then produce a bunch of mucus. That mucus then traps those particles and uh, your body has a chance to expel them using the cilia that line your um, nasal cavity. If that gets too far back, you, I'm sure people have experienced swallowing some of that stuff. But that's not the problem. The problem is the small stuff that gets through your nasal cavity gets down past your pharynx, into your trachea, and then down into your lungs, and especially that end up down in the alveolar sacs. So the really, really small stuff can get all the way down here to the little pockets where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged by capillaries. Here's an example of someone on the left who had normal lungs at the time of death and someone who died of emphysema because of an inflammation and exacerbation in their lungs. And you notice the necrosis and loss of lung tissue throughout the lung. <clears throat> we could have the same picture of someone um, who smoked a lot. Okay, so air pollution is a big killer. Um, and about 3 million people per year die prematurely. And indoor and outdoor air pollution between ranges between 150 to 350,000 deaths. And um, 125,000 Americans get cancer from breathing polluted air, especially diesel fumes. Where in the United States is air quality the best? Well, if you notice where the blue areas are out west, there are less than um, one death per 100,000 adults. The green zone right in the high plains um, is a little bit lower. And where is it the worst? Throughout coal country in West Virginia, parts of Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, um, and then uh, throughout other parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Midwest. The top 10 cities with the most polluted short-term particulate pollution, that's 2.5 over a 24-hour period. Notice Bakersfield, um, uh, Hanford, California, Madera, Fresno, Modesto, Fairbanks, San Jose, Salt Lake City, um, uh, Logan, Utah, into Idaho, Los Angeles, and Carson City, Reno. Notice the number of these that are in California. Why? Well, if we go back to this map, 
Notice that out west was some of the least deaths from air pollution, but yet down here in this part of California, you have some of the worst particulate pollution in the country. Any ideas about that? And if you want to go the other way, the top cleanest cities, um, uh, Burlington, Vermont, Cape Coral, Flor Fort Myers, Florida, Elmira, Corning, New York, Honolulu, Palm Bay, and Wilmington. Notice one, two, three of these, five, um, six, three of those six are, one, two, three, if I can count, are near the ocean. So in um, uh, Titusville, the wind blows off of the Atlantic, which tends to clean the air up, same in Honolulu, and Fort Myers, also the wind blows off of the Gulf Coast. So that's bringing clean air. Now, in terms of indoor air pollutants, radon is uh, a problem that's kind of been under the radar for a while. And it naturally occurs in certain types of rocks. There's some in a little bit in the granite um, throughout southern Appalachians, but more importantly, there are some bands across New York State which have a fair amount of radon in it. And it can seep into homes and buildings, and it decays quickly, which can cause um, lung problems and leukemia. So if we look at how it gets in, if there's some radioactivity down in the soil, it can come through cracks in the floor, if there's a sump pump in the basements. In the south, we don't have very many basements, but up north, basements are very, very common. Um, cracks in the walls, open windows, possibly. Once it gets into the lower basement, it gets sucked up by the furnace. It gets distributed throughout the house. Um, okay, so why is this a problem? Long-term exposure to radon, and if that particulate gets into your lungs with the radioactivity, has the ability to cause mutations in your alveoli, which then can increase lung cancer, possibly causing leukemia, or being, it has been linked to leukemia. Um, but yet there's very, very little emphasis by the EPA, or has historically been little emphasis on indoor air quality, because it's hard to go around to everybody's house and test their house and say, oh, you have to get rid of that kerosene heater because it's producing nitrous oxides when that's your only source of heat. So there are some problems there, but yet it's still an issue that we haven't dealt with well. Okay. Um, uh, the Clean Air Act has been really good at reducing carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxides, and some suspended particles in outdoor air, but there are some things it hasn't addressed, and most notably is carbon dioxide, because it was not part of the original Clean Air Act. And when Congress has um, really failed to solidly increase um, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles, whereas when the EPA raised those, the current administration has rolled back those increases in EPA requirements, which means cars can now be cheaper, but will produce more particulate and more NOx, SOx. It can possibly do that if the manufacturers choose to. Um, motorcycles are not really regulated or two-cycle motors. I know every time I start my lawnmower, there's a big cloud of smoke that comes up, let alone the rototiller, you know, why is that not regulated? Well, it should be a four-cycle engine instead of a two. Um, and there's no really regulation of air pollution on ocean-going ships. And if you've ever taken a cruise, you know that you don't want to be downwind of the smokestack because it's full of particulate and it smells nasty. Another big hole in the Clean Air Act are airports. There are no regulations about um, air quality in airports or around the airports and how much is produced by jet planes. Um, so it's about time for a serious revision of the Clean Air Act. Assuming that can happen in Congress. Now there are some solutions to help reduce air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, but mostly let's focus on outdoor air pollution. Electrostatic precipitators and wet scrubbers. And electro, let's say we're in a coal factory and the smoke is coming out of the factory and going up to a smokestack. Well, if that 
smoke is full of particulate, if we have a, two, a metal ball or tube which um, uh, then has a current going through it, the particulate in the, in the smoke is going to have a charge. And so if you have the opposite charge or a negative and a positive on the, on the different parts here, you will in fact precipitate out that particulate matter, which then can be collected in a hopper at the bottom and then shipped to the landfill. It's taken out of the atmosphere. This requires no water, but it does require a lot of electricity or energy to make it work effectively. The other, there is a, a YouTube video about a homemade electrostatic precipitator. It's kind of a cool little thing. It's kind of a fun experiment if you ever wanted to try it. The other possibility is what's called a wet scrubber, where fine mist is in fact um, uh, sprayed over the incoming particulate, which then basically um, makes it a wet mass, which falls down to a hopper and then can be transported. The problem with this one is it doesn't require as much electricity, but now you have a lot more volume of material and it's all as a slurry. And what can you do with that slurry? If there were a way we could reuse that somehow, that would be really helpful, but we're not real good at that just yet. Okay, so for stationary sources of air pollution, um, uh, what do we need to do? We certainly need to burn low sulfur coal and or um, remove the sulfur from the coal before it's burned. Uh, we are in fact converting from coal to gas, to natural gas in many, many power plants. And we can shift to using less polluting fuels. There are some problems with nuclear, which we'll get to in the next lecture. Um, and we need to do a really, really good job of removing the pollutants after combustion. So if we're going to burn coal or natural gas, we need to make sure we take all the particulates and the NOx and SOx out of there. In 2003, 14 states sued the EPA um, to block um, new rules that would allow older coal burning plants to be grandfathered in, basically. And um, they have subsequently been forced to modernize during, um, between, since this time until 2016. The ones that now need to modernize, they don't necessarily, they are much more grandfathered. There are many more of them that are grandfathered in now. Okay. Um, we have made lots and lots of progress. If you buy a car today or a recent model, it's probably 75% less pollution emitted out of the tailpipe of that vehicle than a car from the 1970s. Also, we no longer burn leaded fuel, which helps a lot. Um, but that applies to the United States. What about developing countries? They don't have the same regulations we have. And if you can make a car cheaper without all of the um, catalytic converters, and etc. on them, companies tend to take those shortcuts. In the United States, we are very vehicle oriented. We all want our own self automobile so we can go wherever we want to go. Lots of countries have gone much more to mass transit. What would it take for the United States to develop the mentality to use mass transit? We're not there yet, but that's a push for the next generation, certainly. And living close enough to be able to bicycle or walk to our job or to, throughout our community, there are pockets of developments that are, are arising that are have a marketplace and homes around it and then playgrounds and shopping, etc. all within a walking distance or a, a little bike ride. That's kind of old-fashioned, but now it's suddenly new wave. Okay. For indoor air pollutants, um, uh, ceiling tiles and AC ducts um, uh, could be either painted or lined to decrease the amount of mineral fibers that are released into the air. Also changing AC filters often helps a lot. Um, banning smoking inside would be a fantastic idea. 
where does the formaldehyde come from? The formaldehyde comes from carpet. Um, my wife recently bought some new carpet and it had it outgassed for two days outside and then she put it, the construction folks put it in her new office and it still needed to sit for another week with ozone machines and air filters going 24 seven and it still is probably gonna give her a headache the first couple days she works there because there's so much formaldehyde in the, used in the process of making the carpet. There's plenty left and it outgasses over time. Um, uh, to prevent radon infiltration, we could seal basements much better, um, especially in those areas where there's radon in the soil. What can we do in terms of indoor air pollution? We can test for radon. There are radon test kits which are relatively cheap and um, they have a, a fairly good half-life. They last for you know, a year or so. Um, uh, we could start using economic pressure to buy furniture that doesn't have formaldehyde in it. <clears throat> and um, we could also, um, uh, pre-1980 houses have to be tested for asbestos. So, for example, in this building, um, this building was built because the old school was full of asbestos and they couldn't have students in the asbestos-laden room, so they had to tear that building down over time, and they built a new school. So just be careful if you're about to purchase a house that you have it tested for asbestos. We've done a much better job of moving to um, much more energy efficient utilities that has helped reduce the amount of electricity consumption which if that's coming from a coal-fired power plant is a serious issue. Um, we need to put more emphasis on renewable energy such as solar, wind, and hydrogen or solar produced hydrogen and um, uh, get better at transferring those technologies from the United States to third world countries so they don't their curve is not so, so long as ours was. Okay, that concludes election, lecture 11, part 2.